we turn to tonight's lecture on Einstein, time, and light. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Bill Phillips. Bill leads the laser cooling and trapping group in the quantum measurement division of the physical measurement laboratory at the National Institutes, sorry, National Institute of Science, Standards, and Technology. He is also a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland, a fellow of the Joint Quantum Institute of NIST and the University of Maryland, and co-director of JQI's Physics Frontier Center. Bill did postdoctoral work at MIT on the magnetic moment of the proton in water. He then went on to develop methods to trap and cool atoms and to study them at rest, or as near as we can get to that. First at MIT and then at NIST. He is particularly recognized for developing the Zeeman slower and for slowing, I'm sorry, the Zeeman slower for slowing and cooling atoms and for many other fundamental contributions to cooling atoms at temperatures so near absolute zero that they are a lot colder than anything else in the universe. Bill was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997, together with Claude Cohn Tanuji and Stephen Chu for their work on atom cooling. The techniques they developed have been powerful tools for studying fundamental physical phenomena and laid the groundwork for the further Nobel Prize winning laboratory formation of Bose-Einstein condensates. And on the more immediately practical level, it led to the development of fantastically accurate clocks that not only are highly valuable tools for physicists, but also lie at the heart of a number of ubiquitous modern technologies, including GPS. Bill is well known for his theatrical, informative, and involving science lectures, like the one he will present tonight. He is a native Pennsylvanian and was educated in Pennsylvania public schools. He earned a BS in physics from Waniata College and a PhD from MIT. His talk tonight is entitled Einstein, Time and Light. Please hold questions to the end and join me in welcoming Bill to the podium. Well, it's a great pleasure to be uh, at the Washington Philosophical uh, Society once again. And uh, guess what? We're going to have fun tonight. Um, and uh, in case you're, you're wondering whether we're going to have fun or not, I just thought maybe I'd uh, try to warm things up just a little bit. There'll be plenty more where that came from. So thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who are Pennsylvanians, I, I realize that the name of my undergraduate institution is difficult to pronounce if you don't know it. It's Juniata College in Huntington, Pennsylvania, for you Pennsylvanians who, uh, who know that uh, liberal arts college. OK, so I'm going to talk about Einstein, time, and light. And as you heard, I'm from the Joint Quantum Institute, NIST, the University of Maryland. It is a tremendous pleasure for me to work with the other permanent members of the laser cooling group and their young people, Gretchen Campbell, Paul Lett, Trey Porto, and Ian Spielman. And I do want to acknowledge the support that we get from the uh, Office of Naval Research and the uh, NSF uh, that has uh, supported work at the University of Maryland at, at it, and at NIST for, for quite a long time. So, um, hmm, this isn't the way I wanted it to look. <laughs> okay, we'll just... Uh, it, it's the wonders of computers. Okay, good. So, 2015 was the International Year of Light, and I went to Paris in January of 2015 to kick off the International Year of Light, and that was around January 20th uh, that I gave a talk similar to this one. Uh, since it's not yet January 20th, I figure it's still the International Year of Light. So uh, we're going to talk about the International Year of Light, and my gosh. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's see now. I should hit two. Ah, uh, yeah. It's, it's the interactions between all this electronics is kind of amazing. Uh, and, a, and it's also got a little bit slow. So did you hear the one about the... Uh, uh, no, that's not good. Okay. Okay, here we go. And back to... 
the presenter view. Okay. So, um, today I'm going to emphasize the science of light, but in fact, the International Year of Light is about light related technologies and including the application of, of appropriate technologies to social issues. And I just want to give you a little idea about that among the things that have been highlighted during the International Year of Light. One dollar eyeglasses. You can make a pair of eyeglasses, someone properly trained, you make a pair of eyeglasses for one dollar in materials and change the lives of uh, young people so they can go to school, of adults so that they can work. Huge thing, light. With essentially zero money, you can turn the inside of a sheet metal shack into an illuminated shack using solar light channeled in through the ceiling through a bottle filled with water. And for 10 or $20, you can give uh, a family a solar powered lamp that for less money than what they would spend on kerosene for the year will allow the children to do homework and not breathe in the fumes that cause a million and a half deaths every year. So these are some of the things that people have been thinking about in the International Year of Light. But one of the reasons that 2015 was chosen as the International Year of Light is that it represents an anniversary year for a number of important milestones in the science of light. We're a thousand years uh, away from uh, the uh, uh, series of books on optics written by uh, a man known as al Hazen in the, in the West, Ibn al Haytham. Uh, in the Arabic countries, he began the modern study of, of, of light. And in fact, many people credit him with the beginning of the scientific method a few hundred years before Europeans uh, uh, came to this realization with people like Roger Bacon. We're 200 years uh, away from uh, Fresnel's theory of diffraction, the idea that light was a wave. Today, we all accept the idea that light is a wave, but in uh, uh, 1815, uh, it was a big question. Newton had said that light was a stream of particles. And Fresnel was the one who convinced people that, uh, that light was a wave. 150 years since uh, Maxwell taught us that the wave that light was, was a wave of electric and magnetic fields. And that light, visible light, was just one manifestation of these electromagnetic waves, others being, uh, as we uh, learned later, things like x-rays or infrared light, uh, 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 radio waves and uh, 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 millimeter waves, all things that came out of the understanding that, uh, that Maxwell gave us uh, 150 years ago. This year, uh, we also, or, 1950, or 2015, we also ce celebrate the centenary of Einstein's theory of general relativity, a theory of gravity that uh, changed our way of thinking about this fundamental force of nature in a, in a way that was at least as fundamental as Newton uh, changed our thinking about gravity. 50 years from the discovery of the cosmic uh, microwave background radiation, the, one of the final proofs that the uh, universe started with a big bang and we're looking at the light left over from that event almost 14 billion years ago. And in that same year, uh, the beginning of modern optical fiber technology which transmits uh, so much of our information today i like to add another one. 110 years isn't quite as even, but Einstein's theory of special relativity in 1905 had a lot more to do with light and changing the way we think uh, about light and the way we think about nature in general that I have to include it. So, Einstein, time, and light. So you might ask, uh, what does Einstein have to do with time? Well, time put Einstein on the cover of their magazine as the, uh, the person of the century. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty good choice because Einstein did all kinds of wonderful things. And here I've emphasized the things that he did that were related to light. Relativity that I've already mentioned, which looks at light in a new light. Uh, the photoelectric effect, the idea that after a century of uh, experimental and theoretical work had established without a doubt that light was a wave, not a particle, the way that Newton said. Einstein said, yes, but let's think about light as a particle as well. And this was the beginning of a, of a revolution in our understanding that everything is both a particle and a wave. Began with Einstein 110 years ago. 
stimulated emission, the basis of the laser. This thing wouldn't work, except for the idea that, uh, that Einstein came up with. Of course, we've talked about general relativity, and you've heard about Bose-Einstein condensation. These are, uh, this was an idea of Einstein's that later he regretted. He thought it must be crazy. Turns out it wasn't. And uh, in uh, 1995, how long ago is that? 20 years ago. Uh, a few heroes out in Boulder, Colorado, made it for the first time and proved that Einstein was right. Wonderful things. Let me just emphasize the thing that Einstein is probably most famous for, the theory of special relativity. In the special, theory of special relativity, Einstein changed our very idea about the nature of space and time. Before Einstein, people thought that space and time was like a fixed stage, like the stage I'm standing on and the events of the, of the universe play out on this stage, but the stage isn't part of the action. And Einstein changed that. Einstein made it clear that the stage itself was part of the action. And one of the ways he did this was by asking himself a question that I suppose people have asked since the beginning of human time. What is time? What is this strange thing that will soon be the past and that is always in the present? What is time? And the answer that he gave may strike you as being a bit superficial, but by taking it seriously, he changed everything. He said, time is what a clock measures. <laughs> well, if time is what a clock measures, then you might ask, what is a clock? A clock is something that ticks, something that gives you a series of events that allow you to tick off whatever. Einstein imagined the following kind of clock. Imagine a pair of mirrors, and imagine light bouncing back and forth between those two mirrors. The round trip time is one tick of the clock. Now, Einstein proposed in his theory of special relativity that every observer would see the speed of light as being the same. So one of the fundamental principles of special relativity. Look at what this does for a clock. If I'm at rest with respect to this stage, and I have this clock and the light is bouncing, then I, s I see the ticks going along. Let's say that I take the, an identical clock and move it along like this. I'm going to see that clock ticking in exactly the same way, because I'm at rest compared to that clock, and everything just looks exactly the same to me. But what does it look like to you? To you, it looks like the light is traveling on this zigzag path. And since light always travels at the same velocity for everyone, it looks to you like my clock is running slow. And if my clock is running slow, and time is what a clock measures, my time is running slow. You may have heard about the twin paradox. There are a pair of twins. They decide to go into different uh, uh, fields of endeavor. One of the twins decides to be a theoretical physicist at the University of Maryland. The other twin decides to be more adventurous. She joins the astronaut corps. And she goes off on a mission to a distant uh, star at uh, a speed close to the velocity of light. This must be sometime in the future. And when she comes back after a mission that by her reckoning took a few years, she's eager to see her brother. She finds that he is old and decrepit and retired, but of course still working, uh, uh, because that's what us physicists do. Uh, and she is still young and vigorous because her clock has been running more slowly because she's moving so fast. You have to move really fast to have it be that kind of an effect. But we have verified this again and again by experiment, that when you're moving, your clock is running slow. So this is what we now call the relativistic time dilation. Now, there are lots of different kinds of clocks. I've, I've showed you one of them. Probably the earliest clock was the rotating Earth. Early uh, ancient people saw the sun rise and set. They didn't know that the Earth was rotating, but they used that rising and setting of the sun to tick off days. There's a story that Galileo was sitting in the cathedral in Pisa, watching the chandelier instead of paying attention to the service. And he was watching it swing back and forth. Today, we call this a pendulum. And what he noticed was, and, and I, I find this astounding, he was timing the swinging of the pendulum, according to this legend. He was timing it with his pulse. And what he found was that the period of the pendulum was the same regardless of whether the chandelier was swinging a lot or whether it was swinging a little. He could tell that by timing it with his own biological clock. 
his pulse. And that opened the door to things like this grandfather's clock, this tall clock that has uh, been the mainstay of, of so many wonderful timekeeping devices. Some of you may be wearing a clock on your wrist, and inside that clock is a quartz crystal. And the vibration of that quartz crystal is the ticker for that clock. There are all sorts of different kinds of clocks. Some of them are famous, some of them are beautiful. You may recognize the clock in the tower of the old post office uh, in downtown Washington. But every one of these clocks is imperfect in some way. This uh, quartz crystal may tick at a different rate depending upon whether you wear it on your wrist or leave it beside the, uh, the bed at night. Uh, the length of a pendulum could shrink or stretch, and that will change its, its period. You see, a short pendulum has a much shorter period than a long pendulum. And so if heat and humidity cause the, uh, the length of the pendulum to stretch, that will change the, uh, uh, the time. Even the rotation of the Earth is not constant. Things like the tides, changing ocean currents, uh, earthquakes change the rotation speed of the Earth. The fact that this is true was uh, made clear to me in a rather dramatic way one day when I was visiting a colleague at the uh, U.S. Naval Observatory. The Navy has been interested in clocks, one of the reasons why they give us money. Uh, ever since the beginning, the Royal Navy uh, in, in, uh, in England even before that. And so he was going to show me his latest uh, uh, clocks, and as we were walking along the corridor, I noticed a door on which was written, Director of Earth Rotation. <laughs> Seems like a rather responsible job. <clears throat> Point is, somebody keeps track of these variations in the, uh, in the rotation rate of the Earth. Uh, now, the best clocks are atomic clocks because atoms are the best tickers. And atoms tick because, as you've probably learned in, in school at some point, uh, atoms have very specific energy levels. And the difference between those energy levels corresponds to a frequency. And we can make that frequency the ticking frequency of our clocks. And the wonderful thing about it is that while every quartz watch is a little different from every other quartz watch, every atom of the same kind, say every cesium-133 atoms, you remember cesium from high school, periodic charts on the left-hand side down toward the bottom, <laughs> burns in air, uh, but we keep it in a vacuum so it's okay. Every cesium-133 atom in the entire universe is identical to every other such cesium atom uh, and they're very little affected by the environment, so they make great tickers. Now, you might ask, how good are these clocks? Well, for less than $100, you can buy a watch like this, even a retro watch like the one that I'm wearing, uh, and it'll be good to about 30 seconds in a year, which is about a part in a million. But if you pay $100,000 for a clock, you can get an atomic clock that is good to a part in 10 to the 12 or 30 seconds in a million years. Now, you may say, $100,000 for a clock, who's going to pay that? But think about this. You pay a thousand times more money, and you get a million times <laughs> better performance. I think that's a bargain. But you still may ask, who wants a clock that good? I mean, most of us don't need to know what time it is to that level of precision in order to go about our daily lives. Or so you may think. I saw this advertisement in a magazine once. It said that if you buy our high-end car and you get into trouble, relax, because help is only 10,000 miles away. And the 10,000 miles they're speaking of is, is the orbiting altitude of the satellites of the Global Positioning System, which you heard about in the introduction. There is a constellation of satellites, at least 24 satellites in orbit at any given time, and on each one of those satellites, there are atomic clocks. Here's how it works. So here's a cartoon of one of those satellites. There's several atomic clocks on board. Here's another one of those 24 satellites with atomic clocks on board. Here are you. Let's imagine you have a clock. You don't in your receiver. But let's just imagine for a moment you do. And all these clocks are synchronized so they're keeping the same time and every one of those satellites knows where it is. Because from ground tracking stations and using the quality of the clocks, they can figure out exactly what the orbit of these satellites is. And these satellites broadcast what time it is. Now remember, everybody's clock is synchronized and the satellites 
broadcast what time it is, but it takes a certain amount of time before that signal telling you what time it is gets to your receiver, where you know what time it is. And you see that the time from the satellite is different from your time because it took a certain amount of time for the signal from the satellite to get to you, traveling at the speed of light, and you know what the speed of light is. That means you know how far away you are from the satellite, which means you are somewhere along this curve. But, of course, there are more satellites. Whoops. And now, you see, I've got to run this darn thing again. So you've got more satellites that are broadcasting information about what time it is and where they are. And when you get the signal from uh, another satellite, you know that you're at the intersection of these two curves, so you know you're right here. Now, that would be great if we lived in a two-dimensional world, like the screen that I'm projecting this on, but we don't. We live in a three-dimensional world, and you don't have a clock, so it turns out you need two more satellites, one to make up for the fact that you're in three dimensions, another to make up for the fact you don't have a clock. So when you turn on your GPS and it says searching for satellites, it's trying to see four. If it gets more, so much the better. But as soon as it can see four satellites, and you can do that from essentially any place on the face of the Earth, as long as you're not in some big city where there are cavernous uh, skyscrapers on all sides. Uh, got lost in Sydney that way once. Uh, then you know where you are anywhere on the face of the Earth to a few meters. And people use these things for all sorts of things. Hikers take them into the, the back country so that they don't get lost. Commercial aircraft and military vehicles use them all the time to figure out where they are. Earth scientists even use them to measure continental drift. They're that good. What do these atomic clocks look like? Well, here's another ad that I saw. Uh, this was for an airline. They said that the uh, recently scientists in Braunschweig, Germany, set the atomic clock back one full second. Our flight schedules have been adjusted accordingly. <laughs> this airline isn't in business anymore. <laughs> but anyway, they got it right about setting the atomic clock back. Why they chose Braunschweig, Germany. This is an American company. Uh, uh, the laboratory in Braunschweig, Germany, is the German equivalent of the laboratory I come from. NIST, okay? And what happens is whenever the Earth rotation gets out of sync with the more stable atomic clock, they make an adjustment. You've probably heard of leap seconds. That's what this is about. Whenever the atomic time and the Earth time get out of sync by 0.9 seconds, they bring it back with a leap second so that things won't get out of adjustment. And uh, But that's not why I showed you this thing. The reason I showed you this thing is to assure you that the instrument in front of which these two dorks are standing. <laughs> Looks nothing like an atomic clock. If you, if you went to our laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, where they have the best atomic clocks in the world, uh, a few years ago, you would have seen an atomic clock that looks like this. And uh, inside this tube is where all the action takes place. And inside there, we have cesium atoms in the gaseous state, so they're floating around freely. And the idea of the atomic clock is, you put the cesium atom into one particular state, uh, one direction in which the electron is spinning, and you shine microwaves in at just the right frequency that makes it go from one state to the other. And when you see that it changes state, then you know that you've got the right frequency. So that's how we make an atomic clock. We just tweak the frequency up until it's right, and then that frequency is the ticking frequency that we use for our atomic clock. Now, that was the oversimplified version. This is just the simplified version. We actually have an atomic beam. That's what's in that long tube. It's, uh, we have a, a, a can of cesium, atom that we, of cesium atoms. Uh, it's a, a, a metal, a solid metal. We heat it up, it melts, it vaporizes, and some of the atoms come out the... Uh, the end, and we have a stream of atoms moving at uh, uh, more than 100 meters per second, and then we see whether the atoms flip their spin. That's the idea. And these clocks are incredibly good, but they are limited in how good they are by how fast the atoms are going. The atoms are moving at 100 meters per second, faster even. The size of the apparatus is on the order of a meter, so that means it's a few thousandths of a second to go from one end to the other. It's not so easy to measure the ticking of something that is only around for a few thousandths of a second. Somebody said it's sort of like trying to tell time from a clock that's whizzing past you at the speed of sound and crashing into the wall. Not so easy. And there are other things. 
the, um, the Doppler shift, the, 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 we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but the fact that the, that the clock is moving means there's a frequency shift. And that frequency shift uh, is a shift in the ticking rate of the clock. So that's no good. And that's, it's a huge effect. Uh, time dilation with Einstein, that, those atoms are moving. Their clocks are running slow. How do we take care of that? So all of these things have been worked on by people for the last 50 years, and they've gotten so good that these clocks were as good as a part in 10 to the 14, 100 times better than what you can buy for $100,000. Uh, uh, but they couldn't get any better because they couldn't deal with all these problems with the atoms moving so, so fast. But we want to do better. In fact, we need to do better for the scientific and technological challenges of our modern world. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to make the atoms go more slowly. And the way we make the atoms go more slowly is by cooling them down. Because the difference between hot and cold is the difference between fast and slow. If you've got a gas, like the air in this room, and the gas is hot, and in fact it feels pretty hot to me, so I'm hoping I can do this without having this come off, which... Uh, uh, it almost did. Uh, we'll just hang that up there. But this is probably going to fall off now. This Madonna-style uh, headset is not my favorite. Uh, I go more for the Tony Bennett, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, no, that was, that was um, of Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett, right? Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm the Tony Bennett. Got <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, if I've got a hot gas, it means the atoms and molecules are moving around really fast, and if the gas is cold, then it means the atoms and molecules are going to be moving more slowly. In fact, temperature is just a measure of the kinetic energy of the stuff that makes up the, the thing that we're talking about the temperature of, and that means that, that the temperature is proportional to the square of the velocity. So in order to give you a feeling for just how cold we want to make stuff, I brought along some really, really cold stuff. Inside this jug is liquid nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is the main constituent of the air. Like 80% of the air is nitrogen. Liquefied, it is so cold that compared to it, the stage on which I'm standing is burning hot. Imagine what would happen if you were to pour cold water onto a red-hot stove it would boil. And that's what happens when I pour this liquid nitrogen out. You know, I'm not sure that everybody's getting a good view of this. <laughs> so I want to make sure that everybody knows just how cold this stuff is. This stuff is absolutely amazing. And uh, unless you have been in a low temperature physics lab, this is probably the coldest stuff you've ever seen. I think we'll just stop because you're going to get a really cold bump. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is the coldest stuff you've ever seen unless you've been in a low temperature physics lab. And so it seems like a pretty good idea to use something like this to cool down a gas. And so I'm going to do that right now, we're going to take what is a traditional container for hot gas, or as we say in this area, hot air, of which there is no lack. So I'm going to fill this with hot air, and my young friend here is going to keep track of what I do. I'm going to take this balloon and stuff it into this bait bucket, which has been filled with liquid nitrogen, to cool down this, the, the, the gas in this balloon so the atoms and molecules will move more slowly. Okay, wonderful. Now, let's see what else we can do. Okay, here is a, a thermos bottle. We call it a Dewar flask, but it's just a thermos bottle, okay? This one even says thermos on it. <laughs> the fact that I have mentioned the brand name in no way indicates that the U.S. government <laughs> endorses this brand of uh, uh, a vacuum bottle. Okay, now, I'm required by law to say that. <laughs> That's true. Okay, this thing has been sitting out all day. It is at room temperature. That means that compared to the liquid nitrogen, this bottle 
is burning hot. Imagine what would happen if you took a, uh, a metal bucket and put it in a fire and heated it up until it was red hot and then poured cold water into the bucket. What would happen? Don't try this at home. What would happen, of course, is that it would boil over. And that's what's happening here. The liquid nitrogen is boiling away on the inside of that can. So while it is boiling away, let's uh, continue uh, with... Uh, so, so what was the color of the balloon that I put in? Okay, let's try a red one. Because we want to cool down the gas so the atoms and molecules move more slowly. So we'll stuff this balloon full of hot air into the, uh, the, the container. Okay, wonderful. Now let's come back to the, uh, the thermos bottle. So I look inside the thermos bottle and I see that the boiling has subsided. It's gone down a lot, so let me top it up. Okay. Now, now that we got that nice and topped up, let's take a nice fresh flower. So these flowers have been sitting out all day. They're at room temperature. Nice fresh flower. <laughs> Compared to the liquid nitrogen, this flower is red hot. It's even red. And imagine that you took a fireplace poker and heated it up in a fire until it was glowing red and then took it out and plunged it into a bucket of cold water. What would happen? It would boil water, right? And that's what's happening here. So we're going to, by the way, I just got to tell you this because I'm so happy with the way you are responding to the liquid nitrogen. <laughs> Every time I throw liquid nitrogen around in front of children, they are so eager to, to, to learn what is going on that they're on the floor looking at the liquid nitrogen. You do that in front of an adult and it seems like something terrible is going to happen here. It's one of the reasons why I like children best because children are most like scientists, because scientists are curious to learn what is going on. In fact, scientists, Remember this, scientists are just kids who never grew out of that natural curiosity. Okay, so uh, while we're letting the flower cool down, let's cool down some more gas. Because after all, we want to have plenty of, uh, plenty of gas so that we can uh, do our, uh, our experiments and... Uh, so let's just stuff that in there. Okay. Yeah, let's just... Uh, okay, great. Now, let's go over here to the flower and see how the flower is doing. Now, I look in here, and I see that the flower, the, the liquid nitrogen isn't boiling anymore. It's, uh, the boiling has subsided. That means the flower is down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen. It is frozen so hard that when I take it out, I can crush it like it was made out of glass. This stuff is amazingly cold. <laughs> and, you know, if you've got something that cold, then it seems perfectly reasonable that you should uh, use it to cool down your gas. And so uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to cool down the... Uh, the liquid nitrogen. Yeah, it is really cold, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of like going outside and making a snowball, you know, and your fingers sort of, you know, you may never get a chance to make a snowball this year, <laughs> the way things are going. So that may be the coldest thing you're going to touch this year. <laughs> because, boy, winter doesn't look like the kind of winters I knew when I was growing up. <laughs> okay, some more, uh, some more cold gas. So what else can we do? Okay, here we go. Here is a rubber band, nice, stretchy rubber band. I'm going to take that rubber band and dunk it into this bucket of liquid nitrogen. Now, you can't see what's going on, uh, but it's making the liquid nitrogen boil. What would you expect, right? The rubber band is red hot. You stick it in here, but now the boiling has subsided, and that means the rubber band is down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen. When I take it out, 
I can break it like it was a dry twig, but all I have to do is warm it up in my hands, and it is a nice stretchy rubber band again. So, you know, this stuff is amazingly cold. And if you've got something that cold, <laughs> what? <laughs> if you've got something that cold, then why not use it to cool down your gas? Because if the gas is colder, then that'll mean that the atoms and molecules are moving more slowly. And uh, if, if they're moving more slowly, then we can uh, make better measurements on them and we'll, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to make better atomic clocks. So let's see, what else can I do? Oh, yeah. Okay. When you were young, I'm sure that when you were working in the... Uh, in the kitchen that your parents told you that you should never, ever, ever put a closed container of liquid into the oven. <laughs> Here I have a container. Here I have some liquid. I'm going to pour a little bit of this. Okay. Now, let's see. Where did I put the lid to this? <laughs> where? On the box. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> see, it's always good to have a bright assistant. Okay, so I'm going to put the lid on really tight. And compared to this liquid nitrogen, the room is an oven. Okay. Let's cool down some more gas. Because the whole point of cooling things down is to make the atoms and molecules more, move more slowly. And if they move more slowly, then everything is going to be easier. It's going to be easier to, to measure their... Uh, uh, their ticking frequency, and we can do all sorts of other amazing things. Now, just how cold is this stuff? The coldest stuff you've ever seen, unless you've been in a low-temperature physics lab, so cold that it boils when you pour it out on the ground, so cold that it turns rubber bands into dry twigs. In order to understand just how cold this stuff is, we have to think about how physicists measure temperatures. Now, in everyday life, we measure the temperature of the air in uh, Celsius. Uh, that's the way it's reported in the minutes of the, uh, uh, the Philosophical Society. Uh, sometimes uh, we use Fahrenheit, a rather nasty uh, 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 temperature scale. But if it's cold enough, and it, it sometimes does get cold, at least in the past it seems like it got cold in Washington, enough so that it was below zero even Fahrenheit, and routinely below zero uh, Celsius. Uh, physicists don't like these below zero numbers. It's just kind of annoying. And so we have a temperature scale where the lowest possible temperature is zero, and all the other temperatures are above zero. On that scale, which we call the Kelvin scale, where zero is the lowest possible temperature, uh, and the degrees, the size of the degrees is the same as the size in, in Celsius, uh, uh, room temperature is about 300 degrees. Water uh, freezes at about 273. Uh, dry ice is about 195. The coldest temperature anybody ever measured on the face of the Earth for an air temperature was in, in Antarctica. Uh, it was 185 degrees above Antarctica, 10 degrees colder than uh, dry ice. That's really cold. This stuff is colder. <laughs> this stuff, which boils when you pour it out on the ground, it's so cold. You understand what I'm saying? It's so cold that it boils because the, the floor is so much hotter than this stuff. 77 degrees above absolute zero. 77 degrees above absolute zero. So, you know, you got something that cold. It seems perfectly reasonable that you would use it to cool down your gas to make the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And that's what we were doing with these balloons. 
But I think that some of you, the more astute among you, noticed that there was something funny going on. <laughs> the volume of the balloons that went in here was larger than the volume of the container. And the container was full when we started. So let's see what's happened. What's happened is that these uh, balloons have turned into frisbees. They are flat as pancakes. Now, how many red balloons went in there? I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking my, my authority, how many red balloons went in? Three, and how many blue balloons went in? Four. And how many did we, did we take out? I'm not sure. Anyway, what a, the, the question was, how many pink balloons went in? What about... Well, people? Your parents were right. <laughs> you should never, ever put a closed container of liquid into the oven, and you should never, ever do what I just did. Because it's a bomb. <laughs> and I think... <laughs> and, 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 and I think that, you know, all, all these tricks are wonderful. But, you know, I've, I've trained with liquid nitrogen since I was 20 years old. And I know all the ways, and you don't even see the things that I'm doing that uh, make it safe for me to do all of this stuff. I didn't take my jacket off because I thought it was hot in here. I took my jacket off because it's dangerous to wear something like that when you're working with liquid nitrogen. And I, you know, when I was fooling around with my watch, I didn't put it back on. That's because wearing jewelry on your hands when you're working with liquid nitrogen is a bad idea. You don't know all these things that I'm doing. You need lots of training to do what I did. So don't think that you're going to get your hands on some liquid nitrogen and, and have some fun. No, no, no. You need, to have, uh, you need to have years of training. Oh, I almost forgot. Nice, bouncy rubber ball. That's see what happens there. But before we look at that, let's go back to here. How many green balloons were there in there? How about orange? What about, uh, there's another pink. Um, there's, uh, that's right, I filled this thing up. I filled this thing up with balloons before you all came in here. I could have kept putting balloons in until the cows came home. But, but look, these balloons went completely flat, not because the air went out of them, but because the air condensed. And this is what's going to happen any time you take a container of, uh, uh, of a gas and put it in contact with a cold refrigerator, like li the liquid nitrogen. The, if it's cold enough, the gas will condense. It will turn into a liquid or a solid, and you won't have a gas anymore. And if you don't have a gas anymore, then you can't make this wonderful atomic clock, even though you've got something really, really cold. Remember how nice and bouncy the rubber ball was? <laughs> Breaks like it's made out of porcelain. But even something that cold has two problems. One is that if you just do ordinary refrigeration, the, the, the stuff condenses. You, you don't have the kind of gas you need to make a good clock. But there's another problem. 77 degrees. That's about one quarter of room temperature. Now remember, the temperature goes like the square of the velocity. That means that at a quarter of the temperature, the velocity is half as fast as it is at room temperature. So when I pour the liquid nitrogen out onto the floor, oh dear, I'm out. But fortunately, I've got more. <laughs> and so when I pour the liquid nitrogen out onto the floor, the people in the front are really happy because it is a little warm in here. And I think you're feeling that it's just a little bit cooler. Uh, uh, the, the nitrogen molecules that come off the, f the floor are moving half as fast, on average, as the nitrogen molecules in the air in this room. Half as fast. Well, a factor of two isn't bad. But I have not spent 35 years of my life to make half-fast atoms. What I wanted to do was to make things that were really, really slow. 
So how are we going to do that? How are we going to make things that are really, really cold and not, uh, uh, and not have them condense? And the answer is we're going to have to cool these things, these atoms, without touching them. And how do we cool them without touching them? Well, remember, this is the International Year of Light. We're going to use light. And the answer to how this works has, in a sense, been staring at us from the heavens for centuries. Because since the time of Kepler, people have known that the tails of comets always point away from the sun. So if you have a comet that's coming in from somewhere way out in the Oort cloud, as it comes in and gets close to the sun, the sun heats up the dust and gas that make up the comet, and the light pushes that dust and gas out to make a tail that streams behind the comet as it comes in and that streams in front of the comet when it goes back out again. So we've known this for centuries. And Maxwell was the first to prove that it was the light that was doing it. Newton didn't think it was. Kepler thought that it was the light. And Maxwell was the one that settled the question. Uh, 150 years since Maxwell did that. And we're going to use the pressure of the light in order to uh, slow down our atoms. And to understand how that works, I got to tell you about two things about the way light interacts with atoms. One is resonance. When I shine light onto a gas of atoms, typically the gas will be transparent to that light. Just like the air in this room is transparent to my laser pointer, right? When I shine the laser pointer across the room, you don't see any laser light until it hits the the wall, that's because it's going right through. It's just transparent. Now, if we turned out all, all the lights, you might see a little bit of the dust that was, uh, was in the air. But typically, the air is transparent. But if the color of the light is just right, which is to say the frequency at which the electromagnetic waves are oscillating is just right, then the atoms in that gas will absorb the light. So for example, let's say I have a gas of sodium atoms, like you see in the yellow street lamps. If you shine that same color of light into that gas of sodium atoms, it will be absorbed. But the color has to be just right. The frequency of light is roughly 10 to the 15 cycles per second. That's a thousand million million cycles per second. If you're off by just a part in a hundred million, that will be enough that the atom will not absorb the light. The, you would never be able to tell the difference between two colors that were, were different by a part in 100 million, a part in 10 to the eighth. But the atoms can tell because they are so exquisitely sensitive. So that's the one thing is that the atoms will not absorb the light and therefore not feel the push from the light unless the color is just right. The other thing is the Doppler shift. Imagine that you're on the seaside and you're seeing waves come in and hit the shore. You could measure the frequency at which the waves are hitting the shore. If you got into a boat and went into the surf, you would see the waves hitting the bow of your boat at a higher frequency. That would be the Doppler shift for, uh, for water waves. If you go back into shore, you'll see them hitting at a lower frequency. Works that way for sound. If you uh, hear, say, a, uh, a car coming along the road, you might hear a sound that looks like this as it passes, that sounds like this as you pass it. You know, as it goes past because of the Doppler shift of the sound. And this is how the cops tell how fast your car is going. They shine light in the form of radio waves, radar, microwaves, and when it bounces off your car, the frequency is shifted because your car is moving. It's how we know the universe is expanding because we look at the color of light from distant stars and see that it's shifted and we can tell how fast they're moving away. So all this stuff about the Doppler shift is something that's common uh, to a lot of experiences. Now, we're going to put all this together. So here are some cartoon atoms. Some of them are moving to the left, some of them are moving to the right, the way you would have in a gas. And here's a laser beam, and it's tuned a little bit too low in frequency for the atoms to absorb the light if they were at rest. But the atoms are not at rest. This atom, moving this way, sees this laser beam Doppler shifted up to a higher frequency. The frequency that it wants to absorb, it absorbs the light and slows down. This atom, on the other hand, is moving away it looks back and says, ah, that frequency is even lower, and it was already too low, and so it won't absorb the light very much. If it did, you see, it would speed up. So the atom going this way slows down a lot, and the atom going this way hardly speeds up at all. Now, 
add another laser beam, and you see now this atom is slowed down by this laser beam, and this atom is slowed down by this laser beam, and you can bring in laser beams from top and bottom and backwards and forwards, and no matter which way the atom goes, it sees those laser beams that oppose its velocity as having the right frequency, it absorbs from them, and it slows down. You heard about Steve Chu, who was, uh, is one of my colleagues in this business. He uh, first did an experiment with this in 1985 when he was at Bell Labs, and uh, he called it optical molasses because the atoms feel as if they're in a viscous fluid. No matter which way they turn, there's a force that opposes uh, their motion. Of course, as you know, Steve Chu was the Secretary of Energy during the first uh, uh, Obama administration. And by the way, this idea is 40 years old uh, in 2015. So, so, so the idea, uh, and all these guys who came up with this idea, Every one of them eventually won a Nobel Prize for something other than laser cooling. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, anyway, um, uh, we can also, uh, woo, great. <laughs> Microsoft PowerPoint has encountered a problem and needs to close. We're sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, I bet they are. Okay. So let's go right back. Uh, okay, now let's go to here. Okay. And we're almost there. There we go. Okay. So the fact that we have a Doppler shift is one of the things that comes from understanding light as waves. Fresnel, 200 years ago. Uh, 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 yeah, it was, it was 200 years ago, not 150 years ago. I don't know where that came from. And what Einstein taught us in uh, 110 years ago, that we should think of atoms of um, uh, light as particles, leads to a heating process, which balances the cooling process that I've told you about. And this leads to uh, a temperature, and you can calculate what that temperature is. And for these sodium atoms, the temperature can be as low as 240 micro degrees above absolute zero. 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. Think about that. This is 77 degrees above absolute zero. And it's the coldest stuff you've ever seen. 77. We're talking about going to one quarter of one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. That is something like uh, 300,000 times colder than, uh, than, than liquid nitrogen. So you can bet that people were really, really interested uh, in this. Uh, and here is a picture from our laboratory of one of the first experiments we did when we brought the laser beams in from all directions and we're cooling a cloud of sodium atoms right here. That's about a centimeter across. There's about 100 million atoms in there. And the question is, what is the temperature? The theory says the temperature could be as cold as 240 microkelvins. So how are you going to measure the temperature of something that's that cold? It's not like you could take a thermometer, you know, and stick it up into the, uh, the, the gas of, the, uh, of, of sodium atoms to see what the temperature was. What we have to do is use our fundamental understanding of what temperature is, which is motion. So we start with the atoms held in the optical molasses. They're jiggling around at some velocity, maybe 30 centimeters per second if they're really cold. Then we turn the laser beams off and the atoms expand. The hotter they are, the faster they expand. After a few milliseconds, we turn the laser beams back on and we recapture the atoms that are left here. The hotter the gas is, the fewer atoms are going to be left. So this way we can figure out what the temperature is. And Steve Chu did that in 1985 and he got 240 microkelvin with a big uncertainty. Remember, two, no, th this is a hard experiment. I mean, look, look, this, this was a really big deal. This was, this was huge because this is the first time that anybody had cooled a gas to anything like this temperature and it wasn't easy to measure the temperature. So even getting it within a factor of two is really wonderful. But notice what the temperature is, 240 microkelvin the temperature that the theory said was the lowest possible temperature you could get. So we repeated those experiments a little bit later, doing exactly the same thing that Steve Chu had done, and we got exactly the same result. But then we started doing some more measurements. 
we wanted to find out whether this optical molasses was as sticky as it was supposed to be and whether it behaved the way it should when we changed the intensity of the laser and the, uh, uh, the frequency of the laser, and it didn't work at all. It was not behaving at all the way it was supposed to. And we asked all of our theory friends all over the world what was going on, and nobody could understand it. So we made a few measurements, and accidentally we discovered that the temperature was much colder than the theory had predicted. The theory said you could get it as cold as 240 microkelvin. In our first set of careful measurements, we got it down to 60. So not just a little bit colder, it was four times colder, or no, 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 I'm sorry, we got it down to 40, it was six times colder. We got it down to 40 microkelvin. It was six times colder than what the theory said was possible. Now this is really strange because you know, the whole idea of the experiment was to make the atoms as cold as we could. We had apparently made them colder than we could. This was clearly a violation of Murphy's Law, and you know, uh, physicists believe in Murphy's Law almost as strongly as we believe in the conservation of energy. <laughs> so uh, we felt a lot like the poor devils in this, uh, in, in this cartoon who have seen something that is a whole lot colder than it is supposed to be for the environment that they're in. And so, um, uh, we, uh, after we confirmed with four different methods for measuring the temperature, what uh, the temperature actually was, uh, we published our results and other people repeated our experiments and found that the temperature was indeed too cold. And that resulted in a lot of discussions about the nature of, of the theory, because obviously there was something wrong with the theory. And I wish I had time to tell you about what was wrong with the theory and the beautiful theory that replaced it. But guided by that new theory, by 1995, we had cooled down a gas of cesium atoms to 700 nanokelvin. That is seven-tenths of one millionth of a degree above absolute zero. This stuff you remember, which is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. It boils when you pour it out on the ground. This stuff is 77 degrees. We're talking about something that is 100 million times colder than this, which we discovered by accident. The velocity of cesium atoms at that temperature is less than a centimeter per second. So now you may ask, what kind of, uh, of clock could we make? Oh, by the way, um, at 700 nanokelvin, this is four million times colder than outer space. So the cosmic microwave background radiation is, has a temperature of about three degrees. So if you're, if you're in the farthest reaches of outer space, so there's no sources of heat, you're just looking at what's left over from the Big Bang, and that's a little bit less than three degrees. We're four million times colder than that. So when I say the coldest stuff in the universe, I mean it, okay? Unless there are people on some other planet who have figured out how to make things colder than we have, this is the coldest stuff in the universe. So uh, how, how can you make a clock with this? Now let me remind you of the, the nature of the, uh, of the atomic clock. We had a cesium oven, we were spitting out atoms a little less than 200 meters per second, and the difficulty is that the atoms just don't stay in the apparatus for very long, only a few milliseconds, and plus all these other things that shift the frequency, the ticking frequency. So now we've got atoms that are only moving one centimeter per second. So at one centimeter per second, what kind of a clock do you make? And the answer is no clock at all because the atoms drop like stones. <laughs> I mean, if you've got something that is moving at one centimeter per second sideways and you let go of it, it's going straight down. But fortunately, that wasn't the end of our uh, uh, attempts to make a clock because 50 years earlier, a guy named Gerald Zacharias at MIT had the clever idea to say, if you had some cold atoms, shoot them up. And then after a while, they will come back down. Now look what happens if you shoot the atoms up about a meter. Instead of sideways a meter, you shoot them up a meter, they come back down after about a second. So instead of having some milliseconds to make the measurement, you've got a whole second to make the measurement. Here's a picture of Don Meikoff and Steve Jeffords with their atomic clock out in our laboratories, our NIST laboratories in Boulder, Colorado. And what they do is they cool the atoms here, they launch them up, they come back down after about a second, and these clocks 
they're called atomic fountains because they're sort of like these jets of water, you know, that go up and come back down. These clocks are the best clocks that have ever been made that tick at the cesium frequency. They are better than a part in 10 to the 16, and they're getting better all the time. That's one second in 300 million years. And it's all made possible by light. But now you may ask yourself the following question. If you've got the coldest stuff in the universe, where do you keep it? Yeah, let's imagine that this bowl is the thing that we're going to try to keep our atoms in. I mean, we wouldn't use a bowl just like this, but just imagine you've got a bowl. And let's say that the bowl is cold. Well, we saw what happens to atoms inside a cold container. They just stick. That wouldn't be any good. So what if the container is hot? Well, if the container is hot, that means all the atoms and molecules in the wall of the container are going to be jiggling around really fast. And if you put an atom in there and it hits the wall, then it's just going to be heated up and it's going to be gone. And you won't, so you can't use a cold bowl. You can't use a hot bowl. You can't use any kind of bowl at all that has any sort of material that is holding the atoms. So you've got to use something that doesn't have any material at all. So now this thing is uh, three, I think, right? OK, let's hope for the best. <laughs> OK, so what I've got here is some magnets. Do you remember the first time you held two magnets in your hand, and you turned them the right way, and you found that they were pushing each other apart, even when they weren't touching? I'm still amazed by that. So what you know is that you can push on one magnet with another magnet without touching it. And that's what we're going to do to our atoms. So now let's go over here, and this one is uh, Four, I think. OK, so what I've got here is a big magnet. This, this thing right here is a big magnet. And here I have a little magnet. The little magnet is our atom, because it turns out that the atoms that we're using, cesium atoms, sodium atoms, are actually little magnets. So we're going to use this big magnet to hold up the little magnet and we're going to try to do the same thing with our atoms. So let's see how it works. So this thing has been arranged so that it's pushing up on this little magnet right here. And if I put it right here, right at the place where the upward push just balances the attraction of gravity, then this thing should just float. And when I let it go, it doesn't float at all. It, <laughs> it flips over and gets attracted to the big magnet. And if you ever tried to do this when you were a kid, that's what always happens when you use ordinary magnets. But you learned something else when you were a kid, and that is that a spinning top will not fall over. And it turns out that our atoms are not just little magnets, they're little spinning magnets. So now I'm going to spin it, and then I'm going to lift it to the place where it should float. And if we're lucky... Now, it, it isn't quite working, but it's your fault. <laughs> Now, the reason it's your fault is that all of you are just so hot. Each one of you is putting out about 100 watts of heat, and that has heated this room up a little bit. So in order to compensate for that, I've taken a little bit of weight off the, uh, uh, the top, and I'm hoping that now it will be able to float. Any, uh, okay, we're going to have to fix this. Any two, <laughs> any two-bit magician can levitate a woman, and um, and uh, and then pass a ring around her, carefully avoiding the wires that are holding her up. But oh god, here, let's do this. Okay, ah. This is, yeah, you believe, right? You believe in fairies too, right? I do believe in fairies. I do believe in fairies. <laughs> but you see, science is about observation. We've got to have, we've got to have the observation. See, I keep doing this because I don't want it to wobble very much. Because if it wobbles too much, then it'll do that. <laughs> 
And yeah, I don't know. Okay, you know, usually it's not that hard. Ah, well, anyway, what I was going to do is I was going to slip this wine glass over. It. You know, another time. Anyway, so that, now we have to go back to the, uh, the PowerPoint. Yeah, there we go. And, of course, it'll be not in the view that I wanted, but it'll be okay. So that's the toy version. Here is the real thing. Nope. Here's the real thing. This is a cloud of cesium atoms at a temperature of a few millionths of a degree, released into a magnetic trap, moving around a little bit, just like you saw the toy version. And, uh, but these are real atoms, uh, ultra cold, and as time goes on, uh, they disappear because the vacuum isn't perfect. They last about a second or a couple of seconds, and then we have to have new atoms. Today, our vacuums are much better, and we can keep them in these traps for 100 seconds. And using this trick of uh, holding the atoms in a magnetic trap and then allowing the most energetic of the atoms to escape, leaving what's behind even colder, these guys, in 1995, did what Einstein had predicted back in 1924, that if you've got a gas of atoms, cold enough and dense enough, then a large fraction of the atoms would simply stop moving. Now today we know that they don't stop moving because we have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that says nothing will ever stop moving. But in 1924, Einstein didn't know about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because it hadn't been uh, developed yet. And when he did know about it, he didn't much like it. <laughs> But today we would say that the atoms are moving as slowly as they possibly can. But there's more. Using traps, holding on to the atoms for as long as we want, you can make even better clocks. So Dave Wyland, one of the originators of the idea of laser cooling, is trapping a single charged atom, an ion, and measuring the ticking frequency, not at microwave frequencies, but at optical frequencies on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz. And he was the first one to get the ticking accurate within the 10 to the minus 18 range. He got a Nobel Prize for other stuff in 2012. <laughs> 10 to the minus 18 range, and, and, uh, but it's not a primary standard because it's not cesium. What it means is one of these days we're going to have to change the definition of what we mean by time to take advantage of this stuff. Junyi, another one of our scientists in our Boulder laboratories, is trapping thousands of laser-cooled strontium atoms, and he's gotten his uh, clock accuracy down to 2.4 times 10 to the minus 18. This is equivalent to one second in the age of the universe. At the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an agency of your United States government, this is what we call close enough for government work. <laughs> and it's light that has made all of this possible. And, uh, well, of course, since my computer shut down several times, I have no idea how long I've been talking, but I'm guessing it's been a long time. Okay, then I'm going to tell you a story. It depends on your time. That's right. When I'm moving so fast, I should be slowing down, right? Okay. So remember, this is the 100th anniversary of general relativity. One of the things that Einstein taught us in his theory of general relativity is that clocks run slower when they're closer to the Earth and faster when they're higher up. When I first went to NIST in 1978, the very best clocks were good to a part in 10 to the 13. That means that the one and a half kilometers between NIST uh, in Gaithersburg and NIST in Boulder was something you could just barely see if you'd had a clock as good as the one in Boulder in Gaithersburg, which we didn't. So you couldn't tell the difference between uh, a clock in the Mile High City uh, to one at sea level because you weren't quite good enough. Today, at a, uh, a few parts in 10 to the 18th, it's possible to see two and a half centimeters, one inch. If we didn't take into account this shift that Einstein taught us about 100 years ago, the global positioning system wouldn't work. Let me tell you a story. So it's, it's 1915. Einstein has just come up with his uh, 
uh, theory of relativity, and the newspapers are reporting that only three people in the world understand this theory. <laughs> one of them is supposedly a guy named Sir Arthur Eddington, one of the top scientists in the UK, in England. Uh, a friend comes to, uh, to Eddington and says, see here, Eddington, it says in the newspaper that only three people in the world understand Einstein's theory. And Eddington says, well, I don't know about that. And the friend says, come now, Eddington, don't be so modest. And he says, no, 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 I was wondering who the third person might be. <laughs> <coughs> a theory that in 1915 was so arcane that it was said that only three people in the world understood the theory. Today, if we didn't have that theory, we wouldn't be able to use our GPS to find our way home tonight. So this is, tells you something about the way science affects our society. Things that seem to be completely useless turn out to be the most important things in our daily lives, like, uh, like the GPS system. So without general relativity, all this stuff wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be possible. So the story of cooling atoms with light, and the story of trapping atoms with light, and the story of clocks that tick with the frequency of light are stories that span the entire world. There are researchers all over the world who are working in these areas and contributing each of them in really important ways. Uh, and so it's a story that is being written even today by hundreds of, of researchers all over. And today, time, atomic clocks, is truly an international story of light for the International Year of Light. So finally, we come to the end of a rather amazing odyssey of making things colder and colder. And I've represented that, that quest for cold in this uh, uh, cartoon of a, of a thermometer that we call a logarithmic thermometer because every tick mark on this thermometer represents a factor of 10 change in the temperature. Up near the top, we have a pretty hot temperature, surface of the sun. Not the hottest thing there is, but pretty hot, right? Just a little bit cooler on this scale is room temperature. And just a little bit cooler than that is liquid nitrogen, the coldest stuff you've ever seen. It boils when you pour it out on the ground. <laughs> and it's just a little bit colder than the surface of the sun in, uh, on, on this scale. Outer space is just a little bit colder than that. The first experiments on laser cooling measured temperature that was colder compared to outer space than outer space is compared to the surface of the sun. And that was just the beginning. So today, we have temperatures using evaporative cooling to make Bose condensations, 50 nanokelvin. But that was just the beginning. They eventually got down below half a nanokelvin, 500 picokelvins. And in the next decade, we're hoping to put some of these experiments up on the International Space Station to get down below one picokelvin. I don't even know what that is. Is that uh, like, like trillions or quadrillions? I don't know. Anyway, uh, 10 to the minus 12, to get down below 10 to the minus 12 uh, uh, degrees Kelvin. If this thermometer were on a regular scale and the top of the thermometer were on the moon, get this, the top of the thermometer is on the moon, the lowest temperature we have today would be as high as the thickness of a human hair. That's how cold this stuff is. So what's next? Well, we've already made better clocks, and those better clocks are already, already being used to make tests of our fundamental understanding of nature, whether the fundamental constants are really constant. We're using these things, and I wish I had time to tell you about quantum computing. It's just so amazing. But what I'm hoping is that this International Year of Light will inspire some of the young people in all these laboratories all over the world to think of even more exciting ideas. And we have young people from all over the world. Our people come from Korea, from China, from, uh, from Kansas, from uh, France, <laughs> from, uh, from Germany, uh, 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 from, from Canada, uh, uh, to, to work together to try to advance our understanding of, of how, uh, how light works and how we can learn more things about the way our world works. And so we come to the end. But you know, it's really just the beginning because there's always something new to learn. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And I know that even though it's not a school night, some of you have to go, and so that's probably a good time to do that. But I am happy to take questions. Yes, and we and, have. We have. We have. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> there is a procedure for questions, so I want to make sure we understand that. We have some guys with microphones, and if you have a question, please stand up or raise your hand so we know who you are and you want to ask a question. The microphone will come to you. But there's just more. Just like that. And okay, but wait a minute. Tell us your name and whether you're a member, and then ask a question. But wait a minute. Okay, but there's more, because more. everyone who asks a question gets a prize. And so what I'm going to try to do is to give the prize to the person carrying the microphone so that we make sure that everybody who asks a question gets a prize. So who's running and can take this back while we're listening to the question? I'm a retired physician and not a physicist. Close enough. And I wonder if you could explain uh, at a... Uh, why is light a constant? Why yeah. is the speed of light a constant? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for it. Um, so so here, here's the problem, as, as people saw it in Einstein's time. Here is a, a source of light, right? And it's emitting light that's traveling at the speed of light. Now, wouldn't it make perfect sense that if you moved the, um, uh, the source of light in the direction in which the light was going, that the light that's coming out of it should be going that much faster. That's the way things work in our ordinary lives, right? If I've got a car that's going along at uh, you know, 100 uh, kilometers per hour and I throw a ball inside the car, somebody on the, the ground is going to measure the sum of those two velocities, and it doesn't work that way for light. And uh, so, so Einstein thought about it this way. He said, imagine that I could travel along with a light wave, moving along with a light wave, what would I see? If I was moving along with a light wave, and that would mean that compared to my velocity, the light wave would be at rest. And what would the fields look like? Those fields are fields that are not allowed by what Maxwell taught us 150 years ago. So he said, well, it must be that I can't go along with, with a beam of light and see it moving uh, slowly compared to me. If I did, it would violate what we already know about the way that the, the fields work. So he figured that it must be that, that everybody is always going to see light traveling at the same velocity. Now, if you ask me, could it have been otherwise? <laughs> could God have decided to make the universe in a different way that Maxwell's equations didn't apply? And nobody knows that. Nobody knows whether we could have a universe that followed a different set of rules. We do know some things. We know that if we didn't have quantum mechanics, which I haven't talked about at all, I give a whole lecture just on quantum mechanics. Uh, if, if we didn't have a different set of rules for the microscopic world, we wouldn't be here. Atoms wouldn't exist. Atoms would collapse if we didn't have things like the uncertainty principle. So we know that we couldn't go back to Newton. A, a world that Newton imagined doesn't exist, cannot exist. We have to have the world of Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger if we want to exist. Do we know whether some other world would work? No, we don't know that. We don't know that it could, and we don't know that it doesn't. So, you know, that's one of the great mysteries of our time that I'd love to know the answer to. Uh, so that's the trouble with explanations is that you can explain certain things, but you always end up explaining them in terms of other things that you can't explain. <laughs> So, okay. who's next? Um, Why don't you start asking your question while your prize is being delivered. By the way, what is this prize? Oh, you, hmm? Oh, okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so okay. what the prize is, is this thing here is a wallet card of a fundamental concept of nature. No one would want to be without one of these. Because it means right, you know, at your fingertips, you always have the value of Planck's constant and the speed of light, and uh, uh, you need these things. And... The reason I'm passing these out is that NIST owns the fundamental constants of nature. <laughs> By that I mean we have the responsibility for every several years coming up with the best, uh, you know, our best knowledge of what these constants are. This is the world's best periodic chart of the elements. It's got 
just packed with information. So, question. Okay, my name is Glenn. I'm a mechanical engineer, but I do have a bachelor's in physics. And I wanted to ask a question. And you know, a bachelor's in physics is so wonderful because you can do almost anything with a bachelor's in physics. You can become a mechanical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so my question concentrates on the time part of your whole... Okay, so all of us are sitting here at rest in space with respect to the room anyway. Yeah. But we are traveling through time. Traveling through time, true. Yeah. Okay. We're all tra time travelers. Past, it's just we're future. all traveling at the same speed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, as we travel through time, are we encountering events that are already there? We're just encountering them, hmm. or are they being <laughs> generated as yeah. we, yeah. at the present? OK, very, very good question. And so the answer is, as always, yes and no. <laughs> so. Uh, it comes down to, or, or a, a mature answer to your question, has to do with the question of relative order in which things happen and the whole idea of simultaneity. So it turns out that two events that appear to be simultaneous to one set of observers, you've got observer A and observer B and say they're moving relative to each other and they agree that uh, there's two events that they both look at and they agree that those two events are simul happen simultaneous two other observers will not agree that those events are simultaneous, and some of them may um, find that uh, those, uh, one happened before the other, and the other will see it the other way around. Well, this sounds crazy, because we have this idea that some events cause other events. But it turns out that it all works out that when events are what people call time-like separated, then they could, one could, in principle, cause the, cause the other. But when they're space-like separated, one could never cause the other. That is, there isn't enough, uh, uh, enough time for the, a signal traveling at the speed of light to get from one event to the other before the other one happened. And so it couldn't have caused it, if you believe that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So you encounter these problems of when something happened and whether I'm going to you know, encounter an event that already happened. Do I know it already happened or not? It depends on who I am and how fast I'm moving and where I am. But we never have problems with causality, which would really freak us out. <laughs> yes? Hi there. Uh, thanks for coming to speak this evening. In light of these recent discoveries, our ability to reach lower temperatures, has anyone ever designed a heat engine uh, based on exploiting uh, like room temperature as a boiling point and these very low level temperatures as... Oh yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so making a heat engine, so just to give you a little bit of background, heat engines work on the difference between uh, the temperature of two things. And uh, Again, it was uh, you know, 19th century French uh, people who taught us uh, how, how this all worked. And so if you've got two different temperatures, you can extract energy from that. And so the question is, if I've got something cold, then that means I could use room temperature for extracting the energy. And the thing that's really important is what the difference in those temperatures are. So I've had things that are really, really cold, then maybe having room temperature wouldn't be such a bad heat engine. Now, the hottest... Uh, the biggest temperature difference you can have is like 300 degrees. So it's not wonderful, even if you had absolute zero, which we can't get to, but you know, you can get pretty close. So 300 degrees isn't that big of a temperature differential compared to say what happens inside your car when you burn gasoline, or what happens inside a power plant when you burn oil or gas or, or nuclear f fuel. I mean, you don't burn nuclear fuel, but you know, you get much higher temperatures. You get higher thermal efficiency. The, high, the bigger the difference in the temperature, the bigger the thermal efficiency is. The other thing is that in order to get to these low temperatures, you have to spend a tremendous amount of energy. These refrigerators that get to really low temperatures are incredibly inefficient. So you wouldn't end up extracting any net energy. The way to do it is to say, go uh, build a heat engine where one end is at the bottom of the ocean, where it's a lot colder, and the other end is up at the surface where it's warmer, and people have, have thought about doing that. I don't think anybody ever actually made one, but that, that would, then you get it for free, you see, because that's what you want. You want your temp temperature difference for free and then to extract energy, which is what happens, say, if you use sunlight to heat something up, then you get that temperature difference for free. 
I mean, you have to build the, the solar collectors, but that's more like it, rather than making something really cold and spending a lot of energy to do that. You got your prize, right? You've got okay. Terry in the back, and then you. Hi, uh, Bob Terry, a member of society here. Uh, thanks for the table. It's got row seven filled out. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, some, some folks I know in the physics game think about quantizing time uh, but now, when you start to go down to shorter and shorter ticks, and if you got to the point where you quantize time, could it tick anymore? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so the idea of quantizing time comes up because while it seems to us that time is continuous, uh, lots of other stuff turns out not to be continuous, and people have speculated that maybe time isn't there either. Right now, there's nothing that is calling out for quantized time, but people speculate just the same. There's and no necessary condition, you say? Um, Essentially, there's no necessary it's condition. It's not necessary. In order to explain anything that we know about today, we don't need to have time be ticking off in, uh, in discrete things for which there's no smaller interval of time. But the time interval that people have suggested as being the, the smallest time interval possible, I mean, it's sort of like by analogy, what's the smallest charge you can have? Well, it's the charge on the electron. Right? You can't have a piece of charge that's smaller than that. And so people wonder, well, is there a piece of time that we could have that you couldn't have a thing smaller than that? Well, maybe so. Uh, and the, the time that's been suggested is a thing called the Planck time. Now, I don't even remember exactly what it is, but it's really, really short. It's like 10 to the minus 40 or 50 seconds. Yeah, yeah, you could probably, it's probably on there somewhere. Maybe not. Maybe there's a bigger <laughs> chart that has things like the Planck time. But anyway, it's really, really short. So we're a long way away from being able to do anything with times that are that short. Uh, but if, if we learned that there was, then what it would mean is it simply wouldn't make any sense to talk about time intervals that were shorter than that. But everything else would be the same. You know, time would go on. It's just it would be a little bit jumpy. But, but you know, current, if I send current through a wire, it's jumpy because it has to be an individual electrons. Most of the time, we never notice that. And we wouldn't notice it if time was jumpy unless we did really, really careful experiments, which we've learned how to do with electricity so that we can actually see the electrons go through one by one. Uh, but it's going to be a long way before we can do that with time. But who knows? That would be fantastic if it turned out to be true. <laughs> because it would mean that we didn't understand what was going on and we're going to learn something new. The Maley. Ah, yes. <laughs> Use the mic. How do we turn it on? Heck if I It's on. It's already oh. on. <laughs> um, so I have one question. Um, so I know you have to be certified <laughs> to use the... <laughs> the liquid nitrogen, that's yeah. right, yeah. And um, if I was certified, how, where would I buy it? Oh, yeah, where would you buy it? <laughs> And the answer to that question, it's an excellent question, and the answer to that question is, as soon as you get certified, you'll know. <laughs> no problem. Once you get certified, you'll know where to get it. <laughs> How long do you have to be certified? Well, so let's say that you were able to come to our lab. Now, we have rules about really young people working in our lab, so I don't think you could come quite yet. But what would happen would be you'd come to my lab, and then I would assign you a, an online course in cryogen safety. Liquid nitrogen is what we call a cryogen, something that's really cold. And then after you took that online course, then we would take you into the lab and we would give you what we call hands-on training. So you would learn how to transfer liquid nitrogen from one container to another. And, you know, of course you'd already learned, but you would learn that you should wear goggles and you should not, you know, wear clothing that can catch the liquid nitrogen and stuff like that. So you would learn all those things. And when we were satisfied that you'd learned all these things, probably a couple of days of working with the stuff, then we would say, okay, you're, uh, you're certified and we would sign some papers and you would be authorized to do experiments with liquid nitrogen. Sure. <laughs> um, so, why, why do you, if, why can't you wear clothes that might get ruined? Like, how would those type uh, of clothes get ruined? Yeah, so it's, my yeah. Won't? yeah, so it's not a matter of the clothes getting ruined. It's the fact that some of the clothing could soak up the liquid nitrogen. Uh -huh. 
So I don't want to have the possibility that I could accidentally pour some liquid nitrogen on something that I was wearing, and then it would be soaked and it would be holding the liquid nitrogen against my skin, and that would give me a frostbite. So let me show you something. Big frostbite. A big frost. Well, it depends. I mean, I, you know, um, I've I've had frostbites from you know before I learned everything that I needed to learn, and just like a millimeter across, that's not so bad. You know, it really isn't that big of a deal. And when you go to the doctor to have a wart taken off, that's what the doctor does. The doctor gives you a frostbite, so it's not that big of a deal. But here's what I want to want to point out. So you saw all that stuff about you know breaking the liquid, uh, the, the the rubber bands and the ball and all that kind of stuff. So it seems like it'd be a really bad idea to get liquid nitrogen on your skin. Now, why can I do that? The reason is that when that liquid nitrogen hits my skin, it immediately vaporizes, and it makes a layer of gas which insulates my skin from the cold liquid nitrogen. No frostbite at all. Now, if I held my hand like that. <laughs> that would be really bad, but you notice I didn't. <laughs> you but you see, these are the things that isn't so evident to an audience watching a uh, a show like this. Come over here. <laughs> so what I want you to do is to watch the liquid nitrogen as I pour it out onto the wooden floor. Now, do you see those drops of liquid nitrogen? They've gone all the way to the other end where the rug is. And they stayed liquid. Now that was a long time, a few seconds. Now I'm going to pour it out on the rug. Gone. The liquid nitrogen stayed cold, so stayed liquid all the way to the other rug, when it was on the wooden floor. That's because when it hit the wooden floor, the floor was so hot, it boiled, gave a little layer of gas, and that drop of liquid nitrogen skidded along the floor like air hockey pucks. But it's making its own air because it's boiling, right? And because it's insulated, it didn't boil away, so it wasn't in good contact with the floor, which would have heated it up and boiled. Now all the little fibers that stick out of the rug get in there and heat up the liquid nitrogen right away, so it boils it right away. But when I pour it on a smooth floor, you see, it just keeps going. And if you've got a long corridor with, say, marble floors, <laughs> you could go a hundred meters. Has yeah. On that. <laughs> so, so this is why uh, uh, I don't want to have, say, long sleeves. Because if I accidentally got some of it on the sleeve, if the sleeve absorbed my uh, the liquid nitrogen and held it against my uh, my skin, then I could get a frostbite. But if my skin is bare, then I don't have to worry. Your hand is like this, uh, like cupped or yeah, something. Yeah, bad idea. It will. Yeah, the liquid nitrogen just would just stay there. Oh. oh. And it, and it would just freeze my skin. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be more like the uh, rubber ball. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be bad. Thank but you for the presentation. <laughs> you're welcome. So I I understand how you can find the atoms. But what I don't understand is how you are able to measure or count the number of atoms that are, have been cooled without heating them up and destroying your experiment. Mm, yeah, okay. So, and the answer is, usually we can't. So most of the experiments that we do involve destructive measurement. So we cool the atoms down, let them go, shine a laser beam on them, and that's one shot. We see where they are, and that tells us how fast they were moving, because you know the, the faster they're moving, the bigger the, uh, uh, the ball of atoms is. And then we do it again, starting you know, all over again and doing it exactly the same way. And we convince ourselves that if we make the same measurement, you know, wait the same amount of time, we get the same answer. We wait a longer time, the thing is bigger, and then we just plot it out. Now, in recent years, we've been developing methods where we can do it either non-destructively or less destructively. So, uh, well, I won't go into that, but, but we have some techniques now where we don't have to, have to destroy all the atoms uh, every time we make a measurement. We maybe only have to destroy 5% of the atoms, and then, then we can measure them again, and we can see a whole, a whole sequence of, uh, of things. But typically, the way we do it, it, it just blows them to smithereens. <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand so we can see you. Um, I have a question. 
So, um, okay. name, Sorry. you remember? Um, my name is Onyx. And the, uh, the, the operator of this camera, so, so thank him yeah, for, for <laughs> being able to see that levitated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm a 3D artist, by the way. Um, so my question is, um, uh, once you uh, continuously uh, lower the temperature to a certain degree, will that break the Heisenberg's uncertainty ah. principle one day? And uh, also capture the photon and uh, freeze it in the freeze it in a certain position someday. Okay, so these are two rather different questions, and I'll try to answer both of them. So remind me if I forget about the second question while answering the first one. So let's just talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for a moment, because uh, what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us is that we cannot know simultaneously both the position and the momentum which is to say the mass times the velocity of a particle. So um, uh, what it explicitly tells us is that the uncertainty that we have in where the particle is times the uncertainty we have in how fast it's going times its mass can never, that product of the two uncertainties can never be smaller than a certain number. And that number is uh, one half h bar. And those of you who have the, uh, the card know how big that is. It's a really, really tiny number. It's like 10 to the minus 30 uh, uh, whatever joules, I forget. Uh, uh, so it's really, really small, uh, joule seconds. Anyway, so we hardly ever see it uh, in ordinary life. But with the atoms, we see it big time. So now the question is, let's say that we keep cooling it down. That means that the uncertainty in its momentum has gotten uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. So you might think that eventually you're going to run into... Uh, something. And you do. It turns out that the slower we make it go, the bigger the cloud has to be. <laughs> and, but, but, but I gotta be honest here. It actually has nothing to do with the temperature. So that description about um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle applies to something at temperature equals zero. Now we never get to zero, but we get close enough that, that you know, it's, it's uh, you know, between friends, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's almost zero. So what we're talking about is the, the sort of extra motion, not the thermal motion, but the extra motion something gets because of quantum mechanics and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So if I want to um, hold something in a trap, and let's say it's at t equals zero, then the Heisenberg uncertainty principle will tell me how fast the stuff is moving. You know, it's a random motion, but there's some spread of, of velocities. Now, if I want to make it uh, go slower, I open up the trap so it's not trapping it so strongly. That'll make the uncertainty in where it is get bigger and the uncertainty in how fast it's going will get smaller. If I want to reduce the uncertainty in where it is, I'll tighten up the trap, okay? That'll squeeze it up and that process of squeezing it up will increase the, uh, uh, the velocity. And so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle will work in all those circumstances and we see it every day. When we go into the lab, we see the, uh, the, the spread in space and the spread in velocity are just what Heisenberg said. We see that all the time. And that's because we've made the temperature so low that it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, capturing the photon. So, people have done these marvelous experiments where they send light into a gas of atoms. And by manipulating the, some other light that's also going into this gas of atoms, they can make the light slow down. So you have light that's traveling at uh, 300 million uh, meters per second, and it goes into this gas, and it could be traveling at one meter per second. But it turns out that you can actually make it stop. So says, how can it stop? And the answer is, it di the light didn't actually stop. All the information about the light went into the atoms. And then I can read it back out again by shining in different kinds of light, and then the light will come back out just like it was coming in, and it'll be like the light had been stored. But it was really the information about the light was stored in the atoms. Yeah, and another thing about this is, the thing that gets slowed down is what's called the group velocity of the light. So let's have a pulse of light and I ask how fast does the center of that pulse move? That's what we call the group velocity. But if I were to look at where the waves were, how fast the waves are moving, that's hardly slowed down at all. 
It seems weird that such a thing could even happen. But the wave velocity of the light is almost unchanged in those experiments. But the group velocity is changed big time. And it's only been in recent years that we've been able to do those kinds of experiments. It's really cool. <laughs> I think we'll have one more question. Uh, Kristen Ferry, and I am a member of the society. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as a pilot uh, over the past 35 years, I've seen definite uh, 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 value from the increased precision of navigation yeah. at a very low dollar cost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first GPS unit I put in my aircraft, though, cost more than I had paid for the aircraft. However... <laughs> you must have got a really good deal on the aircraft, though. I did. <laughs> but as I think about this, though, I began to wonder about the economic value of every order of magnitude yeah. precision, not just in aviation, yeah. but across the world. I was wondering, has anyone quantified that uh, the economic value or, the, or, or what, yeah. uh, what we can do every time you move that an order of magnitude, that precision down another order of magnitude. Yeah, so I don't know that anybody ever correlated uh, how much money it generates, say, for the economy or how much money it saves for, for consumers based on orders of magnitude. But certainly people have said this program of making atomic clocks has led to this and such many billions of dollars. You know, GPS is a multi-billion dollar industry, not to mention the fact that it enables things that would have been otherwise impossible. You know, farmers in the Midwest are having their tractors be uh, uh, run by GPS so they know exactly where these tractors are going, they exa know exactly what they've put on the field, what they've harvested, you know, and it's all done with a precision of, you know, one row of corn <laughs> compared to another. It's just amazing. No, nobody would have thought you could do that kind of thing uh, autonomously before. And uh, so, so people calculate what the economic value of this is. But, but I haven't seen anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, when, I, uh, when I get back, I'm going to ask the, the, the division chief of the time in Fuchsen's division whether anybody ever thought about that in terms of, of orders of magnitude. But one of the th things I want to say about orders of magnitude and improvements Every time we make improvements in atomic clocks, the first application is to scientific uh, questions. So you make a clock good to a part in the 10 to the 18, well, we're not quite there, but almost there, and one of the first things you do is you see what happens when I move it up a foot, and is, do I get what, what Einstein said? Or let's have two of them uh, at, um, uh, using different atoms and let's see whether the ratio of those two frequencies stays the same over time. That'll tell us whether some of the fundamental constants of nature. But what happens is, what happens historically is that every time we've made an improvement, somebody's figured out how to make money with it too. <laughs> so it's, it's that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before you go, uh, as a small token of appreciation, I want to present you with this uh, copy of the announcement of your talk signed by the members of the General Committee on behalf of the members of the Society and all our guests. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much.